Hi, my name is Siobhan Braybrook and I work at UCLA. And in this part two of my series of three talks, what I'm going to do is tell you about what we've uncovered regarding cell wall mechanics in plants and cell growth. If you're interested in a little bit more background on cell walls and their composition, you can see part one. And as you'll see in part three, we're going to expand beyond plants and start asking similar types of questions in seaweeds. But let's dive into cell wall mechanics and cell growth in plants. So plant cell walls actually encase each cell and connect them to their neighbors. So in this example here, we have a single cell wall that's contained, or a single cell that's contained within that cell wall. And so that means that the shape the cell can take is really dictated by the cell wall within which it is surrounded. But because when plant cells grow and expand and then divide, they do so by placing a new cell wall right down the center of that old cell. That actually means that you're connected to your neighbors within a tissue as well. So in the example down here, we have this shared type of cell walls between cells within a tissue. And what you end up with then is really an interconnected set of boxes that really dictate the shape of the organism, the shape of the tissue, and the shape of the cells themselves. So because you have this cell wall, that has really, really strong consequences for cell growth, both how it happens, but also how it must happen. So if you think about that polysaccharide cell matrix encapsulating the cell, it's the cell wall made out of sugars, and if you want to know more about the composition of that, we're going to highlight a little bit of it here, but you can see more in part one. This box within which the cell contents are contained mean that the cell can pull in water and really build up a huge amount of internal pressure. And the pressure within a plant cell can go up to 10 bar, much higher than you would find in your car tire. So it's a really, really high amount of pressure. And so that's encased and held by the cell wall. But if this cell wants to grow or change its shape in any way, it has to yield. The cell wall has to let go. And the way it lets go is going to have consequences for shell shape. So let's imagine we start with a simple square cell. It's got this massive amount of turgor pressure inside, but it's not going to yield all over. Instead, that cell wall box is going to yield in different patches more than others. What that can end up giving you is really quite a complex and interesting cell shape, where some areas here, for example, have expanded more than others down here. So that particular cell shape, and then connected to its neighbors, is what's going to end up giving us organ, tissue, and organismal function. Let's take a more simple example. And this is actually the example we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk today. What if we had something that really just grew more in length or height than it did in width? For example, going from a square to a rectangle. This is two-dimensional, but you could imagine these were cubes doing this exact same thing as well. Well, this is what we tend to call anisotropic growth. You have growth more in one dimension than another. And when this happens, if you think about it, you're going to end up getting more growth of an organ in length than width as well. And how this could happen is if the two walls here on the side yielded more easily to turgor pressure than the two walls on the end and two ends, the top and the bottom, you'd end up growing more in length than you would in width. Well, let's see how that might happen. So cell wall yielding under pressure is going to be a property of the composition and structure of the cell wall. So as I mentioned, we have a polysaccharide-based cell wall. It's mostly made of sugars. And in part one, we talk more specifically about all the different parts of a cell wall that you can find in a plant. But here we're going to start by focusing on two of them. Cellulose, which is a rigid fibrous material, and the gel matrix within which it's embedded. So here we can see an image of a plant cell wall taken with an atomic force microscope. And you can see the fibers in this material that come about due to the cellulose alignment within that material. And you can see it's not completely random. They're sort of going in particular directions in groups. That's all embedded in this gel matrix. And in Arabidopsis, which we're going to talk about in this section, that gel matrix is mostly composed of pectins, which will become important a little bit later on. So we've got a cellulose, fibers embedded in a pectin gel matrix. So our study system is going to be 
a very young seedling in Arabidopsis thaliana. And so this anisotropic growth on a cell level is actually necessary for the anisotropic growth on the seedling level. Here, again, anisotropy is really referring to one dimension being greater than another. We can talk about this in terms of growth. You grow more in one direction than another, or even just in a static shape. In this case, the length is greater than the width, so that would be an anisotropic shape. Here, the seedling is longer than it's wide. That must have been a result of more growth in length than it was in width. It has an anisotropic shape, but we probably is a result of anisotropic growth. OK. So why is anisotropic growth even important at all? Well, if you think about it, this young seedling has a job to do. What it needs to do is it needs to elongate and drive the seedling shoot tip out of the soil so that photosynthesis can become possible for that young plant. And this is done in Arabidopsis by expanding one organ in particular more in length than it does in width. And that organ is known as the hypocotyl. So we're going to talk about this quite a bit for the next section. So this hypocotyl elongates, pushes the shoot tip out of the soil so photosynthesis can start, and that plant can start succeeding in its goal which is to grow and reproduce by fixing carbon. So the hypocotyl is the special organ, again, in Arabidopsis and several other species. And it exists between the root system, which you can see down here, and the shoot tip up here. And it expands almost entirely by cell elongation. There's very little division. So if you grow these guys in the dark, they'll just keep expanding. And so here in my cartoon, but also in this movie, what you can see is as those seeds germinate, they're popping out of their seed coats. The seedlings are starting to elongate. And again, that elongation is mostly due to elongation of the hypocotyl organ. And they're reaching to try and get out of the soil. In this case, they're growing in the dark. We're using an infrared camera to image them. So they're never seeing the light. They're just going to keep trying to find the light. So we can simulate this growth through soil by growing them in complete dark. And you can see them definitely getting very anisotropic. OK. So as I mentioned, this is a dynamic process. And we can actually get that kind of information from the infrared movies I just showed you in the previous slide. So what we're looking at here is a graph of hypocotyl length over time since germination. So we're actually going to start down here at 24 hours post-germination. So just after that seed has popped out of its seed coat, when it really starts growing quickly. And you can see that this is going to have relatively rapid growth over a series of days. But at some point, that growth starts to slow down. And that's really when the seed and the seedling are starting to run out of the reserves that they had stored up. And they need to be reaching the surface and starting to photosynthesize. So you get this nice dynamic growth behavior that happens due to elongation of the organ and elongation of the cells. So let's look at the cells for a moment. What we have here is a 24-hour-old hypocotyl imaged with a scanning electron microscope. This is just when it's about to start that fast elongation process. And what I've done in this image is colored from the base to the top in a file cells numbered 1 through 17. As I mentioned, you pretty much only have cell expansion underlying that massive organ elongation. And so we don't have to think about division. We can really just say cell position 1 through 17 and track their growth over time. Just like we track the growth of the whole organ, we can do that by cell position. And so this is what it tells us. All of those cells don't start expanding at the same time. In fact, we have a wave of expansion that goes from the bottom of the hypocotyl towards the top throughout that eventual organ elongation curve. And so here, what you can see is that the colors match the position of the cells on the diagram. So cell 1 will be down at the base, and cell sort of 17 is up here at the top. And as we move through time, for example, here at 48 hours, you can see that the cells at the base have elongated, but the ones at the top are still quite small. And that's this example of this wave of elongation. And what's interesting is this is not a wave in growth in general. Because we don't see that when we look at the width of the cells over time, only in their length. So when we look at width, we don't really see here much of a wave of width expansion at all. And if you look, the order of magnitude between these two scales 
is incredibly different. So we're getting mostly elongation. The elongation happens in a wave throughout the organ, and there's very little expansion in width. OK, so if we look at that cellular mechanism and we ask, how does a cell wall contribute to a cell growing anisotropically, such that we end up with this anisotropically growing organ, what can we see? Well, if we look at how cells expand, again, anisotropically, there are some nice canonical explanations for how this happened that relate to the cell wall and its structure. Oftentimes, what we think is that cellulose fiber orientation is actually incredibly important for the direction of growth. And so the way that Paul Green would have described this historically was that the cellulose fibers, here in black, are wrapped like hoops around a barrel. And so each individual cell is constrained, actually, from expanding in width, and it can only expand in length. And so we generally believe that the cellulose fiber orientation within the wall can really change how the wall will yield to that internal turgor pressure. I hope it makes sense that these hoops around a barrel would really restrict the width, but facilitate elongation. And so we wanted to ask whether or not this was true in the elongating hypocaudal in a dark grown Arabidopsis seedling. So in order to do this, we had to either directly look at cellulose fibers, and this fiber directionality is something that we call material anisotropy. The material will deform differently depending on its structure and the direction it's pulled in. So we either had to directly look at cellulose fibers or take a slightly easier route, because it's pretty hard to image cellulose fibers, and look at the things that actually control where the cellulose fibers end up. So in order to do that, we have to think about how cellulose actually gets oriented in the cell wall. So let's say in this example we want to have oriented cellulose microfibrils like this, hoops around a barrel restricting cell width expansion. Well, in order to have that happen, we have to think about some of the cytoskeleton inside of the cell. The cytoskeleton in plants is made up of actin and microtubules. And microtubules kind of act like the railroad tracks upon which cellulose synthesis occurs. So here in blue, I've overlaid what microtubules might look like inside the cell with the cellulose fibers in black sort of running along them. We know this is probably true because what we've learned about how cellulose is made at the cell wall surface. So what you can see in this picture is that you have the cellulose fibers in black coming out into the cell wall space. And in green, you actually have these cellulose synthase complexes. And they're moving about in this gray membrane. But they're not just freely diffusing within the membrane. Instead, what you can see is they're connected to the microtubules here in blue. And so anywhere those microtubules are, they really do act like railroad tracks. And the cellulose synthase complex is going to move along that railroad track. And it's going to spit out cellulose fibers behind it. So if I know the orientation of my microtubules, I should be able to predict the orientation of my cellulose. And that's a little bit easier for us to handle experimentally than imaging cellulose directly. So microtubule orientation should guide cellulose orientation, and we can look at that using advanced microscopy. So we decided to do this. We wanted to look at what the microtubule orientation in the hypocaudal looked like during this early anisotropic growth. And our prediction, based on the anisotropic elongation of the cells, would be that we'd have a really strong, what we call, transverse alignment around the middle of the cells. Interestingly, that's not actually what we saw. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to image the epidermis, so the outer layer of cells, the same ones that we were tracking the elongation of earlier, because that's what's really easily accessible for our microscopes at the moment. And when we did this, what we could see is that the microtubules didn't really show the kind of alignment that we might have expected them to. I hope you can kind of see here by eye, it's a little bit more disorganized looking than what you know, my idealized diagram looks like over here. But we can actually quantify that. We can measure within each cell what are the angles of the microtubules. And so to do that, what we do is we say, well, transverse, the direction that would facilitate this kind of elongation growth is going to be sort of zero degrees. And longitudinal, which should facilitate radial expansion, would be at 90 degrees. And so when we measured the microtubule angles in these epidermal cells in many different seedlings, we ended up with this average distribution down here. 
And what you can see is that there's very few microtubules that are oriented in the transverse direction, which is what we expected. In fact, they're kind of more randomly distributed, maybe actually with a bit of a propensity to be longitudinally oriented. This is not what we predicted to see. So why is it that in the epidermis we're not seeing this ordered microtubule array, which should lead to ordered, micro ordered cellulose orientation? Well, one thing to remember is that none of these cells exist in isolation. I told you we're imaging the epidermis, but remember, you have an epidermis, you also have other tissues within this hypocotyl. And just like neighbors within the epidermis are connected to each other by their cell walls, so are neighbors in the radial organization as we move inward in the organ. So what I'm showing you now is a cartoon of a cross section of the hypocotyl. The epidermis is in blue, but we have layers that we call the cortex in pink and purple, and then also the endodermis in the true purple in the center. And so not only are they connected within their tissue, but the cells are connected by their cell walls between tissues. And so we decided to ask whether or not one of these other tissues might show more transverse microtubule alignment. Because it's not necessarily true that each individual cell needs to have that alignment if it's connected to a cell that does. And so, for example, the cortex might show alignment while the epidermis does not. In fact, that's what we found to be true. And so what we did is we looked a little bit deeper with our microscope and quantified what the orientation of microtubules was in the next cortical layer. And so it's a little bit difficult to see in the image. Perhaps if you zoom in, you can see it. But when we quantify the pattern, this is what we saw with respect to microtubule angle. And you can see that almost 40% of the microtubules in the cortex are showing that nice transverse alignment that we would have expected for such anisotropically growing cells. And so in the end, what we think is that the cortical cell microtubules display this transverse alignment. And that's consistent with them having this material anisotropy due to aligned cellulose fibers. And that they just sort of bring the epidermis along with them. Because of this interconnected nature of a plant cell tissue, you don't always have to have all the information for yourself. Different cell layers, different tissues can have different types of information that they convey to each other physically. So the other thing that we then looked into was whether or not there was something in the epidermis that might be contributing to anisotropy at all. And this is because it seems sort of strange that the epidermis would have nothing to do with anisotropic growth especially given some very sort of well-established theories that the epidermis really has a lot to do with when and where cells elongate. Not necessarily their direction, but certainly when they can and cannot. And so we decided to look at cell wall elasticity. So in order to talk about this, I'm going to take a moment to explain what I mean by cell wall elasticity. So before we talked about material anisotropy, which was when I pull on a material in one direction, it behaves differently than when I pull on it in another direction. In this case, we're just going to talk about a really simple material, and that's a spring illustrated here. And we can pretend it's made out of steel. You can choose any metal you want. It's a metal spring. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a weight to it. So I'm going to add a load. And when you do that, the springs deform. And if I took that load away, they would go right back to where they were before. This is an elastic response. It's instantaneous, and it's completely reversible. And so a plant cell wall under pressure from inside, that's the force now from inside, could behave elastically. And that could influence how and where it actually yields to that pressure. But what you might imagine is if I take this spring here, and I say, well, let's make a spring that looks exactly the same, but is made of a slightly different material. Well, then, when I put two weights on it, it's not going to deform as much as the silver spring. And that's because the material will dictate how the spring will deform under load, just like the material of the cell wall dictates how it deforms under pressure. OK. So what I want to propose to you, then, is that we actually have a really interesting combination of methods. We're going to look at the microtubules. That's going to give us an idea of the material anisotropy. But we actually have to look at cell wall elasticity if we want to test a particular hypothesis. So our hypothesis was this. Just based on the growth and the shapes alone, you could imagine that a reason you could get 
anisotropic cell expansion, even when you had very little microtubule orientation or cellulose orientation, is because the walls along the sides of the cell were just more deformable to turgor pressure, and the walls at the top and bottom were less deformable. They were more elastic here and less elastic here where they're red. So we have to measure wall elasticity. Well, how do we do that? How could we possibly get to whether or not this hypothesis was true, that we had elastic asymmetry in the epidermal cell walls? In order to do that, we use an atomic force microscope, and we can measure cell wall mechanical properties with it. So an AFM can really be thought of as almost like a needle on a record player. We have a flexible cantilever, and so if it's a very flexible cantilever, you can kind of draw it along the surface and sort of get an idea of what the topography of a surface might be, like someone reading Braille with their fingertips. But if you make that cantilever stiff enough, what you can actually do is push into the cells and the material. So if I were, for example, to try and indent the bone in my arm, it would take a lot more force than it would take to indent the skin or the muscle in my arm. So understanding how much force it takes to deform a material can tell you something about its elasticity. And so when we do this in young seedlings, we place them in a solution that reduces the turgor pressure inside. So when we're pushing on them, it's not like pushing your finger on your bike tire to check its pressure. You're only measuring the cell wall, not the internal turgor pressure. So this is in liquid. And what you can see is the AFM tip is scanning along the surface of the seedling. And it's going to generate a map of how easy it was to indent or deform certain areas over others. And from this, what we get is a value of stiffness of the cell wall or indentation modulus, which are both ways of talking about elasticity. The higher those numbers are, the less elastic the tissue is, the more force we had to apply to deform it. So here's an example of the type of data that we see. So this is a stiffness map. Again, each point here, each pixel, represents a single indentation event. And from that, we can get both the stiffness map, as you see here, but also actually the sample topography. So we can see where the cells actually are in terms of their height, as I mentioned, but also where cell walls are stiffer or softer. And remember, the higher this value is, the stiffer the wall was, the more difficult it was to deform. So let's look in these elongating seedlings. What do we actually see? Is there any evidence for this elastic asymmetry? So what I'm going to do is orient you by telling you about what we name the cell walls, just so we can keep track in our head of which wall we're talking about. So the walls that we predict to perhaps be more elastic have a lower stiffness or indentation modulus or axial walls, because they run along the axis of elongation. And transverse are what we're going to predict to be the stiffer cell walls running this way. So these are two maps of the indentation modulus or elasticity of the cell walls. And what we're looking at is just after germination, and then when those cells are starting to elongate anisotropically. And I hope it's pretty obvious in this one. It appears as though you have higher values on the transverse wall than you do on the axial walls that run sort of this way. In order to quantify for that, that for you, we can display it in a graphical format as well which perhaps is slightly more convincing. Actually, at both time points, we can see that the transverse walls, the ones that run across the width of the hypocotyl, are always with a higher modulus, so they're always stiffer, they're always harder to indent, versus the axial walls, the ones that are going to elongate, are more deformable under load from the AFM. And so what this tells us is that we really do think there is evidence for elastic asymmetry in the epidermis that perhaps these walls, because they're more elastic, can deform more easily under turgor pressure, allowing anisotropic growth to occur. And what we do know here is that there are differences in the cell wall composition as well between these walls. So for example, in the walls where we have higher modulus, where it's harder to deform, lower elasticity, we tend to have stiffer pectin. That cell wall matrix within which the fibers of cellulose are embedded actually gels more up in those top walls than it does along the walls that we think of as being more fluid, more elastic, more able to grow. So we think that anisotropic growth could actually result from combined cell wall mechanisms. Because these cells don't exist in isolation, 
They don't have to have all the same information, but together they end up making a really, really well-designed system for anisotropic elongation. So we have both material asymmetry, oh, sorry, elastic asymmetry and material anisotropy. So the cellulose orientation, again, is in the cortex, not really in the epidermis, but in the epidermis instead, we have this elastic asymmetry that we just saw with the AFM. And when we combine these two things together in a computational model, we see that seedlings in our simulations that have both sources of information grow faster and should predictably get out of the soil sooner. So it's a really robust way to have anisotropic elongation in a multicellular organism. So I mentioned before that we thought the pectin biochemistry could be important. How the pectin gels more in one place than another could affect this elasticity that we measure with the AFM and potentially the growth behavior of the cells. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I'm going to do is tell you about homogalacturonan. This is the most prevalent pectin in the Arabidopsis cell wall. And here I've just diagrammed it very simply as it comes out into the cell wall from the inside of the cell. And this is in what we call an esterified form. So these little orange balls represent ester groups. And th this is an uncharged molecule. So it comes out nice and fluid and uncharged. And what happens is that some of those ester groups end up being taken off. And that happens through the activity of an enzyme called pectin methylesterase. And as they get taken off, they actually expose negative charges on the tips of each of these little triangle sugars. And those negative charges, when you get enough of them, can actually bind with calcium ions, shown here as little black balls. And that is what ends up giving you the gelling behavior of pectin. If you want to see a more technical chemical diagram of this, you can see that in part one. So the more deesterification we have, the more we remove those groups, the more we can cross-link with calcium, and potentially the more rigid our gel becomes. And so we could see evidence of there being more deesterified pectin on those rigid transverse walls than, and more fluid pectin with its ester groups intact on those elongating axial walls. Now, let's see what happens if we manipulate the system a little bit. So, as I told you, there's this enzyme pectin methylesterase that will drive pectin from this more fluid state to a calcium crosslink state by removing those groups. But there's another protein that we can use as well called pectin methylesterase inhibitor, which does, as its name suggests, inhibits the activity of pectin methylesterase. So if we express pectin methylesterase, or PME, we should drive pectin into a more crosslink state. But if we express the pectin methylesterase inhibitor here, it should keep the pectin in the fluid state up here, and potentially we'll see more growth. So let's see whether or not that was true. Now, I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to give you one piece of evidence that's not in the hypocotyl. And if you want to see what happens in the hypocotyl, you're more than welcome to go and look at our paper that was published in eLife. But instead, I want to give you a piece of evidence here of what happens in the actual leaves of the young seedling. Because I think the more evidence I can give you that pectin controls growth of cells and organs, the better it will be for your understanding. So what we're going to do is we're going to take non-transgenic and transgenic plants. And the transgenic Arabidopsis plants here, they're going to be expressing an inducible form of pectin methylesterase or the pectin methylesterase inhibitor. And what that means is we can turn on the activity of these two different proteins and drive pectin either towards cross-linking in the PME case or keep it in the fluid case in PMEI. And what we're going to do is we're going to have images of what the young seedling leaves look like here, but also heat maps of the cell areas here that'll tell you how big the cells have become. So this is what we see in a tr non-transgenic plant. But if we take a PME-expressing plant and we induce the activity of PME, this is what we see. So as we might predict, if we're driving pectin into a more rigid state, you can see that the organs are smaller, but also the cells are much smaller. And you can see that by the preponderance of blue here. So that's on the same heat scale for area of cells. We've gotten a lot smaller in our cells. Smaller cells, they're not expanding as much, so your organs don't expand as much. And again, what you might expect happens when you drive the expression of PMEI, we keep pectin more fluid, potentially we allow things to grow more, is exactly the opposite. 
we get larger organs, as you can see down here, and we end up getting larger cells as well. So again, we're not talking necessarily about the direction here, but more just the magnitude of cell expansion. And we think that the pectin gel matrix is actually either directly or indirectly a really important regulator of how easy it is for plant cells to grow, perhaps by modulating the elasticity of the cell wall. So what have we learned so far then about how a cell wall yields under pressure and how this property is determined by its composition and structure? So we know now that cellulose orientation leads to this material anisotropy, but remember that doesn't have to be in every single cell. As long as some cells that are connected together contain that information, that is potentially enough for an entire tissue or organ to become anisotropic. But we also have this new piece of information, and that's that maybe this wall elasticity, elastic asymmetry in the hypocaudal, but just general elasticity overall, could actually be controlling the magnitude of how much cells are able to expand. And the directional information gets laid in by the cellulose fiber orientation. So what I want to end with is this idea that cell walls don't just exist in plants. And if you go to the introduction in part one, we'll explore this a little bit more. But suffice to say here that we see plant cell walls, or sorry, polysaccharide-based cell walls throughout the tree of life. You can see plants up here at the top, but also seaweeds, green algae, even some animals. They're known as tunicates have polysaccharide-based cell walls, but so do bacteria and fungi. So all of these organisms have polysaccharide-based cell walls that are put down outside of their cell membranes. And what we might ask is whether or not there are similar physical mechanisms regulating cell expansion in all of these cases. Because all of these cell walls with polysaccharides building them up are containing the cells within them. So they must also have to yield materially. And what we wanted to ask next was whether or not the gel matrix in seaweeds here might be regulating growth in a similar way to that which pectin does in plants. And that's what we'll be discussing in part three. So with that, I'd like to thank the funders and the people who've done the work that you've seen in this talk. First of all, an incredibly talented scientist who's been working with me, Faras Dahir, did almost all of the experimental work that you saw here, alongside with a recent graduate student from the lab, Dr. Yan Jae Chen. Our computational modeling, which I didn't show you, but you should check out in our paper, was done by another graduate student, Baruj Borzorg, and he was mentored by Professor Henrik Janssen at the University of Cambridge. The work was funded by the BBSRC, which is a UK funding agency, also the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, and the European Union Horizon 2020 program, because my lab used to be in the UK until we moved recently to UCLA, which is where we've been receiving our funding thus far. <laughs>